Welcome to another Impact Wednesday. We're so happy to be here as well. We are so blessed to be one more time bringing you all this good news right there at your house. We're going to lift up in prayer to Pastor Mike, Pastor Durrell, in order for the Holy Ghost to take control. So this powerful message or this word for tonight will find a place in your heart and also not just find a place, make you a doer of the word of God. Let's lift up in prayer, Pastor Mike and Pastor Darrell, so the Holy Ghost is already taking control. But we need for you where you are that the Lord has start moving in the spirit so you can achieve and receive from the bottom of your heart and be a doer of the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and for today, a beautiful day that you have created for us to enjoy and to come here and testify because we are witness of your power. We are witness of you have, what you have done in our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for you to give the anointing to Pastor Mike and Pastor Darrell so that war has been seasoned like a salt so it can taste good so you can really swallow and you can learn through it. Oh, Lord, we thank you because we understand that through this pandemic, these times, you're still moving. We might not see nothing, but we know that you are doing greater things. We know that you are doing big things. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, oh, Lord, because tonight is another wonderful night to take advantage of this teaching in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. amen. Pastor Danelle. Thank you so much, amen. Pastor Mario. Amen. Well, good evening, Prevailing Word Christian Center family and friends. I'm so glad you joined us tonight on Let's Talk Kingdom Talk. We're going to continue on in our discussion um, as we did last week. You know, it, it's in our world today, it's so important that we remember as believers, what is it that we're hoping for? Who is it that we are looking to? Who are we waiting for? Jesus. What power can we stand in? The power of Jesus. So tonight, amen, my husband, my friend, Pastor Michael Armwine is here, and we're going to continue in the word. He's going to lead us. So you know what? First of all, you already know, bring me the book. Don't play, bring me the book. Now, get your Bible, get your pencil, get your paper, take some notes because you will have something to reflect on, go back and study and see if it is so. Amen? You ready for this? All right, let's go. Pastor Mike. Praise God. It's uh, wonderful to be with you guys again. And we're going to get into something that's going to continue out, not just tonight, but even Sunday. Uh, I want to talk with you if we can discuss this subject, which is a great subject, is the reason Jesus Christ will return. The reason Jesus Christ will return. And so we're going to begin. I'm going to ask my wife to go ahead and read. Let's go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We want to grab verses 1 through 6. Again, that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Uh, of course, he, my wife is going to read it from one version. I'm going to give you a, a couple highlights as she, as she finishes the reading of what we're going to kind of engage into. Okay. okay. 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 1 reads as this. But re realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderous, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, 
conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such of people as these. For among them are those who slip in the households and captive weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. Wow, that's wow. pretty strong. Wow. Paul, Paul didn't waste any time uh, as he breaks open in the very first verse. He says, remember, no, in the last days. Yeah. The last days, there will be many troubles, difficulties, trouble, times. We cannot say without, without question, we're not there. We we're, we're, we're right there right now. And you can see it in, in the life of people how crazy this is. But I'm going to go ahead and give you an outline of what we're going to try to look at as we go through this entire study. And this is just an outline. One of the first points we want to look at, to fulfill the prophecies and promises. This is one of the reasons why Jesus must return, is the fulfillment of prophecies and the promises. Number two, to save mankind from total destruction. If Jesus doesn't come back, mankind ain't going to make it, you guys. And you can already see that by the things that are happening. I mean, if... if these guys get a chance, they'll destroy all of us. Number three, to resurrect and transform his followers to immortality. So he must come back. See, th this is the reason he must come back. Because of what's going to happen with the believers that have died mm -hmm. and the ones that remain. We're going to be transformed. Right. Number four, to appear... In glory for vindication and honor. To appear in glory for vindication and honor. Number five. To reign as king over all the nations. To reign as king over all the nations. And lastly, number six. To deliver and elevate Israel. Did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. To deliver and elevate Israel. One thing about God, he never forgets what's been done. And he's a great rewarder. Yes. I want to go ahead and open up and, and talk about this real briefly as we really, we're going to get into some stuff tonight. It's going to be really good. We're surrounded with all kinds of trials as well as living in troubled times. But there still remains something very wonderful and hopeful. Though the world is oppressed by darkness, and it is getting darker. Did you know that? Yeah. It's getting darker. Yeah. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Okay. Let's take a look at something. Isaiah chapter 60, and let's look at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 60, and let's look at verse 1. You got to stick with me tonight, because we're going to deal with a lot of scriptures. Okay? Isaiah 60 and 1 says... Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Whoa. He says that we're to rise, for the light has come. Okay, now, interesting enough, we're going to play with this light stuff a little bit. In the beginning of your Bible, something transpires. It, there are a lot of people that have a lot of comments about it, what they think went on and, and, and might, may have happened. Mm -hmm. But obviously something was incorrect with the creation because God don't make no messes, you guys. No. But something happened. Yeah. And because it, it was so, so catastrophic, the Bible says the Spirit of God began to move over the, over the face of the deep, of the waters. He, he began to move. And in the Hebrew, he's actually fluttering, almost like a bird. He's, he's fluttering over the, over the waters. And why was he doing this, Pastor? He was waiting for the word. Now, all three were there, and, and it's used in the Hebrew, the Elohim. The Elohim. 
In other words, this is the three working in a creative form. God is known by his multi names. Uh, if I could say this to you so you would get it. Every time God is seen uh, by the angels that are suspended in animation and flutter and fly, you have one angel that has wings that covers his feet and uh, on the back he has wings that, that keep him flying and he has another set of wings he can cover his face. And every time he sees God, he cries, holy, holy, holy. Why? Because God keeps changing dimensions. Oh. He, he is so vast and so great. He can right. change dimensions yes. in an instant, constantly, constantly. So the angels are vividly looking at this and they're mesmerized by it. Right. They're not just crying, holy, just blankly saying right. a statement. Right. They're mesmerized by God. Like, whoa. And this is the whole point of this. Rise, shine for the glory, for his light has come. What is his light? It is his glory. Yes. He's, he's, he's glorifying himself in the people. We're going to go further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where there seems to be no hope, suddenly mm. hope arises in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. The Messiah to the Jews. He is the light of the world. Did you hear what I said? Jesus is the light of the world. This is also to call us to action. Oh, rise. See, we, we're not to just uh, be stalemated just because we're at home. We're to rise. We're to rise in prayer. We're to rise to get in the word of God. We're to rise to communicate with other believers. We're to rise to, to uh, begin to be concerned about those who are without God. Are you hearing me? Because this is very important. So he says, I need you to rise. He says, I don't want you to get up and fret and rise and be nervous. I, I don't want you to do that. But the word says shine. And it explains more fully in, 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 in the verse. It's going to come out even more because we're going to check it out in verse 2. Let's go back to Isaiah 60 and let's look at verse 2. Isaiah 60 and verse 2 says, For behold... Darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. Wow. 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 Now, wait a minute. Let's, let's do a little study here because we need to find out something. This darkness symbolizes evil. Yeah. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. This darkness symbolizes evil. The darkness was uh, both spiritual and physical. Mm -hmm. The darkness here is, is similar to the darkness that was over Egypt. Okay. Okay. okay, it's the same darkness. And that darkness was so thick, the people could feel it almost. I don't know if you've ever been yeah. in a place where it's so dark, you don't see nothing. Yeah. You can feel it. You, you can actually feel it. You know, uh, back, back when I was a little boy, I think it was like maybe about seven or eight, we were in uh, Rubido, California. And my, my, wife, my mother's cousin, uh, husband, had an egg ranch. And so we were out there, and I didn't know how dark it got out there. I, I really didn't know. And uh, all of a sudden, my mother turned off the lights. And I said, wait, turn those lights back on. <laughs> she said, what's wrong? So I said, Mom, it's a little bit too dark in here. This, this is real darkness. She said, yes, yeah, son, out here in the country... It's not a whole lot of light. And, you know, normally you, you, can, you can see stars and all that. It wasn't no stars to see. It was like the clouds had covered all the stars. And, man, it was dark. I mean, you couldn't see nothing. I was uncomfortable for a long time. But my mother did a, she did a trick on me, of course. She left the lights on until I went to sleep. And then she turned the lights off once I fell asleep. And so I didn't, I didn't know they were. it was dark. I really didn't understand all of that. But this point that we want to make here is the extreme pressure of darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, we had something in the beginning of the Bible that dealt with darkness, and we see light had to show up, okay, in order for this to be rectified. What did God say? Let there be light. And so now light began to turn up everything of who God is. God is the God of light. God ain't the God of darkness. Okay? And we're going to get further into that because we need to understand exactly where this is going. 
God's people will always have the light of Jesus Christ shining upon them. In the midst of great darkness, sometimes the only light there is, is the light of Jesus Christ that the Christian signs forth. That's That's it. it. Now, let me, let me say this so nobody get this wrong. Christians don't have light. We don't, we don't produce it. The light comes from Jesus. Now, I'm going to mess with something with this. Let, let's go to Luke's gospel. Go to Luke chapter 2, and let's look at verse 9. Luke chapter 2, and let's look at verse 9. Luke chapter 2, verse 9 says, And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened Mm. this shining around them is the light of god this is illuminating light okay this is this is not this is not just a, a figmentation of writing something down when god is present light is present all the time. All the time. All the time. And it's important that we establish that. Let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians, babe, and let's look at 5 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5 says this. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Wait a minute. You are sons yes, of, light. of light. First of all, he uses the word son because he's talking about family. Mm-hmm. We are the family that shines in light. Mm-hmm. No Christian should be talking dark. Okay. Because you're from a family of light. Of light. Oh, you don't get it. Let's say that again. That may declare that you have not fully embraced the light. You might see the light, but back away from it. And we're going, to ex- we're going to explain why. Why would a person who is a believer backing away from the light? Shouldn't they embrace it? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Because you're sons of light and of the day. You are not of, or, or, of, of night and nor of darkness. That's not who you are. God came to Moses, and I want to deal with this. This is where we're going to go. Okay. Moses was called by God by the sign of a burning bush. Mm-hmm. What is this all about, Pastor Mike? Why would God bring this man to a burning bush? Because the purpose of the man was related to the burning bush. Right. And so God had to start the fire in the man. The man had no fire. God had to start a fire in him. So he brought him to a bush to make him look at the brilliance of the light while he was pushing light in him. Okay. Okay. Now Moses didn't know what that light was going to do because he had never discovered the glory of God. He didn't know what that was like. And many of us Christians, if the reason why you need to be in the word, the word is the way that the light begins to click on. Yes. You know, when you start the, the, um, the oven in my house or the, 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 the pilot there in the house, it has to ignite it. Okay. And it's waiting for the spark. And God was talking to Moses. Watch this. So he could get him lit. Okay. Because Moses was taught by the Egyptians. He was not yet taught by God. He knew about God through people that had shared some things, but he had never really met God. And so God didn't bring himself down in an angel form. He didn't come and sit on a log with him. He didn't do like he did with Jesus at the woman at the well. But he comes to this man in the form of a bush. He had to mesmerize him. Sometimes people, in order for them to come to God, they need to be mesmerized. And the only thing that can mesmerize a sinner is the power of the Holy Ghost. Without the power of the Holy Ghost, you cannot amaze people. Because you're using self-effort. You're using your own innate strength. But when you use supernatural power, then things begin to move in a whole nother way. God had to captivate this man. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this man was born to be a leader. 
but he didn't know the leader he was supposed to be. You ever watch people and you can look at them and say, man, they got some leadership in them. Yes. But there's something not quite right uh, with them leading right now. And so God has to help that thing get correct. Hello. Hello. And the Bible says he kept him out there in the, in the, in the desert with him for 40 years. Ain't that something? See, you see, you got to be out there sometime train a lot longer than some folk. You know, they come into church and get a little wet and learn a, a verse or two in the Bible and they're ready to preach. Baby, you need to sit down and get some, some, some understanding about what you're talking about. But let's deal with this a little further. The Bible says, babe, over in Exodus chapter 34, and I want you to go there. Exodus chapter 34, and we want to look at verse 29, and we want to look at verse 30. Something happens to Moses. Something unusual. And I believe that this same anointing is available for every believer. But you got to do this a certain way. Exodus 34, and I'm going to start with verse 29. It says, and it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to approach him. Wow. wow. What happened, Pastor, when Moses was up there with God? What, what, what's going on? God was talking with Moses. Yes. And I'm going to help you Christians that don't read the Bible. You don't know what you're missing. The presence of God is in his literature. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? Moses didn't have a chance to read the Bible. He heard the voice of God. Right. And God kept talking, talking to this to man. And the man in the presence of the voice of God was being transformed. He didn't even know it. Oh, this is greater than you this can. This is great. This is greater than you know. God began to place on this man his visible glory. And so as Moses is coming down from the mount, the people are seeing this light. And, you know, you, you're thinking maybe got a torch or something, you, you know. This boy's face is all lit up. What, what's, what's happening? But the closer they're getting to him, they're not seeing anything. But you, you forgot what he was carrying. He was carrying the word of God. It was in his hand. He was coming down the mount with the word of God to bring to the people. My God. And God was all over the man because he was all over his word. Go back to the beginning of your Bible. The Bible says that the spirit of God moved on the face of the waters of the deep and darkness was on the face. Everything was dark. But then the word of God came and God said, let, let there, there be light. light. Hallelujah. Now, interesting enough, in John's gospel, the first chapter, God does something here through John to get us to understand another beginning. And he shares with us that the word of God was in the beginning. Ah, so, so now the subject matter of logos and rhema has to come up. One is the, the large body of the word. One is the specific word of God. Okay, so you've got two bodies of the word here. One is the large containment of the words, and one are, or some are the specific words. In other words, God has specific words to his people. Mm -hmm. I want to say something to you. I want to say something to you directly. Mm -hmm. Okay? That, that is called rhema. That's rhema. Okay? That's rhema. Logos is, is the large embodiment of the word. It's, a, it's, it's the, the word totality. Now I'm going to say something that will flip your brain. When he came down from the mount with the Ten Commandments, even though me and you look at a gang of words, it really was only one word from God. If you read the Torah, you would read it totally different than you read in the English. The English gives us a kind of a picture of it, but not the full totality. See, God don't have to say many words, 
for it to be many words. Oh, God. He's not he's not man. He's not he doesn't walk in limitations like I do. OK, but the more I'm exposed to him, guess what happens? I don't walk in limitations. So when Moses was coming down, he was coming down with no limits. Oh, God. This is why the glory is shining all over this man. There's no limitations to the man who's been in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. This is how long. In fact, if you read the rest of the, 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 the capture of that over there in Exodus, you'll find out something really interesting. This is crazy, you guys. Moses fasted without water and without food. What was keeping this man nourished? The presence of God. The very presence of God. Yes. It was feeding him. Oh. Mm. So are you saying that as mm. we sit in the presence of God, he gives us spiritual food and it manifests in our physical body? Yes, it does. It take, it's like our physical body is getting fed by the spirit of God. Well, let's go there, dear. In Matthew's gospel, the fourth chapter, it says man cannot live. By bread alone. But what? But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is from God's words that everything exists. Go back to John's gospel. Nothing is made without the word. Nothing. So you mean God can't take care of man that he's going to have before him for 40 days and 40 nights? He was feeding that, bro. That's why the man wasn't worried about nothing. He was in the presence of God. Or oh, when you get in the presence, you don't come out stinking. You don't come out acting like you did, <laughs> you know, when you was in the world. You start acting like God. You start behaving like he does. Yes. You take on his nature. Mm -hmm. Of course, what we're simply saying, we're speaking of the presence of God. And, and, and Jesus in the world was the presence of God manifested. He was manifesting the father in the world for everybody to see. Because remember, he was invisible for folk, folks to touch. Mm -hmm. So Jesus came to go ahead and reveal what the father was like. Can, can you imagine why the disciples didn't want to leave him? Yeah. See, if you really get in the presence of God, you don't want to get out. No. Half of the reasons, half of the time in my thoughts, people ain't really been in the presence of God. Yeah. You haven't yeah. been there. You've been near about it. You've heard about it, but you haven't been there. How do you know? You come out still with the wrong attitude. You haven't been in God's presence, baby. Because when you're in his presence, something is transformed. Yes. Something changes about you. Hello. And you have a desire for God like nobody's business. You just do. Now, you might ask, Pastor, what has this got to do with us understanding the reason why Jesus came? Baby, until you get excited. About this Jesus. And because we're going to read some verses here that ain't just as sweet as you think. They're going to put some hair on your head. Yeah. Amen. But you're going to have to deal with this. Um, there's always a controversy when statements are made in the Bible to people. Really, when we discuss this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We got posts. We got trip. Mm -hmm. We got people that, you know. They got all these fascinations about the coming of Jesus. I just right, like reading right. the Bible. I don't know about everybody else. And so there can be misinterpretations of scriptures. Even some translations, you've got to be a little careful with them. They can water down the original meaning of the word. And so then it doesn't have the effect it should have on you. Correct. Words are very powerful. Yeah, they are. And, and if they're said the right way, they can affect you in emotionally. They, they can mess you up. Hello. Some people are jacked up in this world because of words spoken over them. Listen at me. It's the truth. So now when we, when we deal with this subject of the, this, 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 uh, the reason why Jesus must come, we got we to gotta vacuum in quite a few things that lay out the subject. And so we first have to go to this tremendous God we're dealing with. Who are we dealing with? We're not dealing with the things that we're limited to. See, whenever we, we move into uh, um, uh, the talk of God, we move out of the realm of limitation into a place where there's no limits. Okay? And this is very powerful. So the subject needs to be studied carefully, with wisdom, yes. and under the presence of the Holy Ghost. Yes. I, don't, I, don't, I don't take studying scripture lightly anytime. 
It, it needs to be delved into. And then the Holy Ghost has to release the anointing for people to get it. So let me, go, let me go further here. The Bible warns that in the last times, scoffers are going to come. Let's go to 2 Peter. Exactly. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we want to look at verses 3 and 4. Yeah, that's a good one. So 2 Peter 3, starting with uh, verse 3, says this. Now, now this first of all, that in the last days... Mockers will come, and with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all these things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, you know what? This verse unlocks a lot of stuff. Yeah. This is why people play risky games mm -hmm. with their Christianity. They would never say to me or you, I'm a, I'm a scoffer. I'm a mocker of God. But their actions depict they don't believe he's coming. Right. Listen at me. It is not just that you go out and get the fruit of the spirit and you're just a lovely person. I'm going to be honest with you. If you learn the Bible correctly, you're going to make some people mad. It's the truth. That's the fact. There are a lot of people that will stand before you and declare they're Christians. But if you watch them, they don't act nothing like a Christian in the Bible. Nothing. Okay? And so what does that say, Pastor? They have formed their own gospel. In the book of Galatians, Paul said, be careful. That you don't come up now with a new gospel that's apart from this Jesus who's died for you. Okay. And it's so e it easily happens. Okay. Coming to church does not make you no more a Christian than you own a Cadillac and calling it, and it's nothing but a Volkswagen. Okay. Hello. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who think because yeah. they go to church, a building, yeah. Go to church. They carry a Bible. Yeah. They sit in the front row okay. and they have a title. They're a Christian. The Bible will laugh at you. Yes. You don't match anything of what Jesus talked about. Right. So we must go into this. Now, let, let me let me let me pull out a, a subject here. Noah was told by God that Things are not right. And I'm going to have to change the world. Hello. Why? Because God knows what he makes. Oh, my goodness. God don't make mistakes. No, 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 no. People make mistakes, mm -hmm. not God. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find this out in his definitiveness in his own character of who he is. Even though we will, we're going to grab that subject of, of Noah, there is still an, another place, though, we, we, have to, we have to deal with this because the coming of Jesus is so important. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about preachers that won't preach it. They, they won't talk about the coming. And, 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 and listen, it's all in the Bible from the Old Testament to the to New, the new. So how are you going to avoid teaching what's right in your face? Exactly. You, you, you got to teach it. You, you got to go and look at the verses. And you got to ask God to reveal the information. Mm -hmm. So let's begin to do this. <clears throat> We're going to go with point one first. To fulfill prophecy and promises. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with that first. In fact, dear, go grab St. John chapter 14 verse 3. St. John 14 and 3 says this, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you also will be. Okay, now, now let's go here, because remember, we're talking about fulfillment now, a prophecy, and also the promises. So if, if Jesus mm -hmm. is going to return 
we must be able to find it in the Bible. It must be in Scripture. See, there ain't no making up nothing now. This, this is just the Bible. We're going to see where Jesus makes the statements so that we understand this is the teaching of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Eschatology should be taught. Last day things should be taught. Amen. People should not be Amen. ignorant of what's going to happen in the end times. Why, pastor? It will make you live pure. It will make you walk right before God. There you go. Amen. Now, here's, here's the reason I love the teaching of it. My mother and father never told me when they left when they were coming back. And you know what I kept doing? Looking yeah. out the window. And I'd get a little nervous. Is that them coming up to... Is that the car? I think I can hear him. Okay, I got a little bit more time to act up. <laughs> and, and, and I would, you know, because I, 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 I felt like since they ain't there, I can get away with it. But then when I heard them feet come, I'm like, uh-oh, it's over. It's over. It's over. Put, put, that, put that up. Get that up. Put that away. Can I tell you something that God did uh, through Jesus? And, and me and my wife watched something. We'll talk about this real oh, briefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We watched what the wedding really looks like Jewishly, especially with the Galileans. Yes. See, the teaching of the wedding is a little bit off in some of our ideas of Jewish weddings. Baby, it's a whole lot different than what you think. In fact, dear, let's talk about it real briefly before okay. we, we okay. get too deep. Okay. But, but remember when uh, the, the bride was uh, um, um, being told by the bridegroom that he wanted to marry her? Do you remember that? What what, what were some of the things that stuck out that you saw? Well, one of the things that stuck out to me was that the bride was not there alone, but the bridegroom came with his father. He approached her family and announced that he wanted to marry her. And a covenant was made right then and there. Correct. But it it was understood. What stood out to me was, she stood there and she watched as the, the, the groom, the bridegroom, the potential groom says, right. I want to marry you. And I'm going to be in preparation to make you my wife. And she stood there. She acquiesced. She said, yes. yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what stood out to me was immediately, they didn't go off alone together. No. He went off with with his entourage, his father, his groommen, his friends that were going to help him. Mm -hmm. She went off with her friends and her family, and each party began to prepare themselves for this union that was to take place. So it wasn't a quick courtship. It wasn't a quick courtship. Mm. So this was a a lengthy thing. It It took time because it was preparations that had to be made. Now, here's one thing that I think that was unique in it. The father represented God. Watch this. Only the father knew the time that that the bridegroom would be given the words, go get your bride. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do this on his own. It had to come from the father. This part stood out to me for the bride. Right. Because they could see each other passing in, in, the, in the marketplace. Right. And he was buying uh, things for the household. It was the, he was put, putting things together for the household. She was preparing her bridal garment. Right. And this is something that really stood out in the Galilean uh, uh, tradition of the Jewish Galileans. The bride would begin to, they would work on her dress. Well, women go buy their wedding dresses. She, in, that, in those days, they made the wedding dresses, stitched it. And once the dress was ready, it still didn't mean that the wedding was going to take place that day or next week. Mm-mm. So this is what the bride would do. Every evening, her bridesmaids and her would wash They'd prepare and, uh, this garment. She would get prepared as if she was getting married that night. She, the dress was laid out. She slept in the dress. So she had to stay ready. She had to stay ready. She had to stay ready because she never knew when he was going to show up. 
And so every night, I mean, they laid out, I, they did her hair. Uh, she washed, prepared her makeup. She go in the bed. Okay. She go in the bed. And the thing was her, her bridesmaids and those who were in attendance to her, it's almost like your friends, your, your wedding party comes to live with you. It's a big girl well, it's a big thing. sleepover yeah. that lasts for almost a year. It could be a year. And mm -hmm. it's a girl's time. But everybody's getting ready. They're doing their makeup. And they go to sleep that way. I'm like, well, I, I would think you hang the dress up. No, because in case. Right. Because she didn't know. She didn't know. And the thing that was so funny was the groom didn't know. The groom didn't know either. He was still building <laughs> the house. He was adding on, get this, he's adding on rooms. He's getting the lumber and he's getting the building equipment. And he's adding on rooms to his father's house. Listen. And so in he, my father's, father's house are many, many rooms. rooms. So he's adding rooms to his father's house. So the father had to have some money because the, <laughs> the groom is adding on his living quarters with, for him and his bride. Now, once he had, and I mean, it wasn't just the, the putting up stucco and all of that stuff. No, he had furniture. He had to put furniture in. He had to put the eating utensils, uh, the cooking pottery, the linens, with the bedding, uh, the towels. He did everything. And after he did all that, he would go to bed. And the father is watching. Yes. His dad is watching him. Yes. And once the dad has surveyed the, the, the rooms, mm -hmm. not just one room, he's adding on rooms for his bride. Once he's finished all of that and he goes to sleep, the dad goes and he wakes up while the groom is sleeping. Right. And he goes to survey to see how he has put together the home. He will then go and wake, wake up his, his son. son. He wake his son up, go get your bride. He didn't wait till sunrise. It could be midnight. And if the father said, go get, get your, your bride, bride. They had to be ready. They had to be ready. The groom would hop up so excited. He'd wake up his groom because the groom men were with, him. were with him. They had moved in with him, helped him fix up the house. And they became a part. And everyone else who were at their households that wanted to attend this, the wedding, the groom would come out with the shofar, and he would blow the horn walking down the street to let everybody Body in know. town, yep. it's about to, to go, go down. down. I'm going to get my girl. <laughs> and those who wanted to be a part of this, everybody was anticipating. They were ready immediately. Everybody. And they began to, to follow him down the street to the bride's house, and she would hear the horn. She would jump up. Her bridesmaids were ready, and they had their dresses on. The bride had on her dresses. Remember, she would go to bed every night washed, yes. prepped, yes. and ready. Yes. So when she heard that shofar, she knew it was her man. Okay. It was her man. And when they got to the house, the bride would come out to meet her groom. They would then go into where the wedding ceremony would take place. And the wedding ceremony was not just an hour, hour and a half. The wedding ceremony had a banquet that lasted for seven days. days. When we go and Jesus comes to get his bride, the wedding banquet will last for seven years. Listen, y'all. Remember that he says, be ready. And he even gives the illustration of the ten virgins. Five of the virgins who were in attendance to the bride. Five were ready. They had their oils lit. They were ready to go. Five were not ready. And they didn't have enough oil to make it through the bridal procession. And they had to go out and get oil. Well, by the time they got back, the door had closed. And in the Galilean wedding, yep. if you were not ready and say, oh, you over at the last minute, you heard the last trumpet and you went to run and you were running to get into the wedding party and they closed the door. You couldn't get in. You couldn't get in. 
It didn't matter if you banging on the door. Hey, let me in. Let me in. I want to come in. in. I'm ready. No, you couldn't come in. You missed out on the wedding feast, and it would be going on for seven days. Now, when we saw that, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. We took a whole nother view. Yeah. And the Gal- the, the, the Galileans, they understood Jesus when he would talk yeah. about him coming again. They understood it yes. because that's the way the weddings were done. Yes. So Jesus was relating to them about the kingdom. Mm-hmm. I said, this is too deep, man. Mm-hmm. We missed this whole presentation. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go back to scriptures because I got some more for you. Go to Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 30. Matthew chapter 24 mm-hmm. and look at verse 30. And that reads, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and with great glory. Oh, that's just that's, that's awesome. But watch this. The nations then will be hostile to his return. Mm. Listen to me. Everybody's not going to be excited that Jesus is coming back. Mm. They're not. And that's why we got the scoffers. Well, we're not done. Let's go to Revelation chapter um, 1 and look at verse 7. I'm going to bring up a couple things here that I need to grab. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Okay. Revelation 1 and 7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who, per- who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Wait a minute. This piercing is talking about the Jewish people. Because they're going to be pierced to realize they were the ones that crucified Jesus. Mm, And it's going to break their hearts. It's going to to make them understand. This was really, really a horrible thing that was done to Jesus. And he did it for us. He did it so we could have life eternal. My God. When Jesus' disciples watched him ascend into the clouds, On the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem, the angel told them, this same Jesus who you you see taken from you and up to heaven will come again in like manner. Yes. Yes. Just like you saw him go, he will return the same way. Yes. Why did the angels do that? Now, there's a lot in that whole depiction, y'all. This is deep. It represents the mercy seat. Two angels are there. The Ark of the Covenant always has two angels facing each other. They also represent Isaiah chapter 6, where the angels are suspended and God is in the middle. Jesus, when he departed, these angels were the same two angels that were at the grave. Mm -hmm. And they were on each side of the body. Yes, They were representing the, the, the mercy seat. Why was that necessary, Pastor? Because God is still, God never breaks establishing things so that he can continue to bless us. Mm -hmm. The mercy seat says God's presence is amongst you. That's why the angel said, don't worry about him leaving. Baby, he's coming back. He's coming back. He's going to come right back again. And I believe the disciples got encouraged when the angels said that to them. They begin to get strength with that. Oh, my God. The Christian should not be afraid knowing that Jesus is coming. He should get strengthened in that. Yes. That he can walk in boldness. He can walk in faith. He can stay committed to the things of God yes. because he knows that this is true. This is true. This is a truth. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Let, let, me, let me climb a little further. Let's go to Jude. I want to go to Jude, and I want to grab a little something here for you. Go, go to Jude chapter, well, it's just one, one and, we, and we'll get 14 and 15 there. 14, Jude, Jude 14 and 15. Uh-huh. Jude, 
J-U-D-E. Jude 1 and 14 says this. It was also about the people that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Wow. Babe, go already over to Psalms 96 and verse 13. We're going to follow the scriptures. We're just going to see what the scriptures are saying. Psalms 96. Shh. Yes. <laughs> Psalms 96. And we're going to start there with verse, verse 13. Verse 13. Mm -hmm. Amen. Verse 13. Behold the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. My goodness. Looking at the coming of Jesus is going to bring justice. Mm -hmm. There are people in the earth who are following Jesus and they're crying for justice. Yes. For things to be fair and for things to be right. Let me, let me offer this information to you. It won't be right until Jesus returns. Right. Man cannot make it right. right. He wants it right, but he can't make it right. Looking at America, just taking a brief look at America, seeing the number of people that voted this year. I mean, we had a record number of people that voted. Mm -hmm. But here's something interesting in the vote. The country is divided. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Watch this. This is going to sound crazy. Yeah. The, the name of this country is the United States of America. Yet we are not united because the only one that can unite us yes is god is god he's the only one that knows how to help us work with our differences mm -hmm. and get along with each other okay. without god that's the most hardest thing listen you can go and get you know talk to my psychiatrist and Whatever therapist and, you know, take a couple of pills and hopefully you calm down. But the truth is, until you see like God sees people, you will not get along with people. You have every reason to be against someone for actions you are not even around to see. But because of the history that's been passed down through the generations... And also, the things we presently see, we know there's no justice in the earth. Okay. We know. And so the people are crying for it. Where is the justice? Right. Now, here's something that's wild about God. God can hear blood. <laughs> yes. He can hear blood when yes. it hits the ground. Yes, it talks. It has a voice. I died innocently. It was not right. And God says, don't worry, blood. I will bring justice to that. Okay. I will vindicate you. Okay. Yes, I will. Now, even in the earth, men are doing their best with the courts and all of that to make decisions. But can I tell you, the unjust judges will sometimes side with unfair things. Right, right, right. Yet they will go to church and sit and hear the Bible. Oh, this is horrible. Why? Because Jesus doesn't have a relationship with them. Oh, don't tell me we don't need him to come. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We, we need him so bad to come. In the last verse of Revelation, it says, come quickly. Yeah. 
Can I tell you one of my prayers is always, Lord, please come quickly. Maranatha. Because, see, men, if men don't get this right, we're, we're going to tear things up. Yeah. And if you recall, and, and I, let's see if I'll go there and we'll stop with that. Noah's time was a very crazy moment. And, and, I, and I can express this without reading a whole lot to you right now. Mm -hmm. In Genesis chapter 6, you have a man who God said was a righteous man. His name was Noah. Correct. And the Bible says Noah walked with God. Mm -hmm. And because he did, God told Noah, I'm going to have to destroy the world. Mm -hmm. Because men's thoughts are wicked continuously. Listen, just because you read the Bible, don't tell me you don't get wicked thoughts. Because you're lying. Yes, you do. The only difference is if you're filling your mind with the word of God, you have something to combat it. If there's no word in your mind, you're no different than the sinner in the world. You can think dirty thoughts all day long. Hello. Ain't none of us got a, 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 a machine. We looking in your head and we see what you're thinking. We don't, we don't have that kind of machine. No. Now, what we do have is the Holy Ghost who will tell on you. Now, I'm going to say this before I close out. One thing I found out in studying the Bible, God is the biggest teller teller I ever met. He will tell it. God will tell on you. Sometimes he has mercy and he keeps it real quiet. But there's other times God will tell on you. Yes, he will. Sometimes I look at my wife. I said, God told her. I know he told her because he's the biggest teller teller I ever met in my life. But here's the thing. If I'm honest before God and if, if I'm, uh, 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 you know, not trying to hide it, God is so gracious and so merciful to me. Now, this study is going to take me a moment to, to unlock quite a few things. We're just embracing the first part. Right. But I'm telling you, it's going to be so good. Some of you are going to say, man, why don't they preach this? Why don't they preach this? Yeah. Because they don't want to study. Can I tell you, the Bible teaches that a preacher has to be in season and out of season. Yes. You don't get good days to, to study. You just study. You just study. You have to study. Why? You can't teach what you don't know. And lead people astray and cause them to live in sin because they got a bunch of things. Things don't make people live holy. Righteousness in the, in the word of God and the truth of God's word convicts our hearts. It makes us repent. Amen. What am I saying to those of you that are listening tonight and as I get ready to close? This may be the moment you might need to get your heart right with God. That's right. You might need to repent and ask God to forgive you, Christian. Please. And if you're without God, your repentance is not going to do, any, do you any good. You must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you must believe that God has raised him from the dead. Yes. And the Bible says if you believe that, then you have the right to be saved. Without that, you cannot be saved, friend. We're not. My time is gone. And I want to thank you for your time. I pray that you got something today from this teaching and that you will continue to study with us. This coming Sunday, like I said, I'm going to pick it right back up. Amen. This is going to be a part of our teaching. Why? Why are we stressing this at this season? Because you've got to get ready. You must stay ready. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Just stay ready. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's left his written word. He's even given us the, 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 the secrets. He's revealed to us, this is what you look for. I'm coming when this happens. Just keep ready. I'm coming back for my, my girl. I'm coming back for my bride. Will you be ready when he blows the trumpet? Listen, I'm so glad you joined us for Let's Talk Kingdom Talk. We're going to continue on in this vein. For the next few weeks, preparing. Know that we love you. We are praying for you. We know that God has you in his hands. May the Lord God bless you. May the Lord God keep you. May the Lord God cause his countenance to shine on you and give you peace. I'll see you next week. Shalom. I want to thank you again for joining us for Impact Wednesday. It was such a delight having you in our class. If you have any questions regarding the Bible study or if you have a prayer request, be sure to email us at avcpwcc.org. All right. See you next week.
Yeah, no, I love that boy. Well, we gonna get into this one. I this love one. that. This one's gonna be fun, bro. This yeah. one's gonna be fun. I love that. We can't make sure I caught it. Oh no, 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 no. We're not sure before nothing. It's just the book. You can stir up the waters, man. Yeah, we just stir up them waters. We gonna just teach the book. That's all we gonna keep doing. Just, just teach what the book. Brother Gary.